Look, we've had the pleasure of having a three screen start the last time y'all heard from us. Guess what we got now? Another three screen start for you listening on the radio on the Mightier 1090. I'm John Browner. That's Broke Grossman. And we have, you know, a legend. We just go, we go, a legend can be many things. Okay. And how we break this story down when we're done, you will be calling him a legend too. This is the Burton Browner show. We're available on YouTube. We're subscribe, like, uh, 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 comment, follow us on YouTube. I got to do all these things first, Tony, because you know, I bills, you. people. We're brought to you by the Stri- Senegal Strike First Force, the place where Bert's a coach, believe it or not. Yeah. Tony yeah. Mandridge, our guest of guests. Welcome in. He's got a podcast himself. What's the title of this podcast? Again, I don't want to get it wrong. My podcast is One Man's Ethos. Uh, what? Yeah, one I gotta, man's I gotta look up what ethos means right now, my yeah. I still don't know what it means. <laughs> one man ethos. We I figured if I can't spell it, I might as well use it because it sounds yeah. smart. There you go. You gotta pique the interest of the intellectuals. We right. gotta change ours up, Brown. You wanna do two man's Cheetos? <laughs> no, <laughs> or what do you want to do, Brad? Let's switch ours up. Two men and hot flaming Cheetos. How about that? <laughs> yeah, I like that one. I like that one. That's what we're gonna go with from now on. We are uh, this is gonna be a great conversation because you and Bert have so many similarities, but you also have so many differences. I saw a picture of you and I saw a picture of Bert during the draft uh, as I was doing research for this interview. Oh my god, I, I didn't know where to start, but what I will start with this <laughs> Tony is before you chose a college. Because I know this about Bert. What was high school sports like for you? Well, it was interesting. It was unique because because I'm from Canada. So three years of, of my high school was in Canada. And, and my last year, my senior year of high school was in Kent, Ohio. Okay. And at that time, Ohio was one of the top three high school like football states. Like they just pumped out like athletes like crazy in the, these major colleges. And then, you know, and then Florida started to become dominant. Texas started to become dominant. Pennsylvania was already, I think, dominant. California also. But for some reason, Ohio and Pennsylvania were just like football factories for high school football players uh, that went on to big colleges and, and went on to play. So high school football for me was great. Athletics was great. I did things in high school um, to improve my athletic ability for the sole purpose of playing football. Okay. It's like, I mean, I made a conscious decision to do that. Um, so if I, if I, you know, we did the fat man four by 100 relay in track and field and also through the shot put also through the discus, you know, did wrestling. I hated wrestling in high school. Um, but I did it because I knew it would make me a better athlete. And so when you were, when you were doing all these things, what was the what was the outcome? Were you over? Were you uber successful? Because a lot of times when you hear a guy, oh, he was taken second, you think that he's always been the number one athlete. He's always been the top guy. Were you just like suplexing people like WWE style in wrestling? Were you throwing a shot for like a million yards? Like, uh, well, like hold a- on. wait, how how far did you throw a shot with Tony in high school? Not far enough. How far? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, let me know. I swear, I swear, I couldn't even tell you because I mean, I was always, I was what I would cons- consider a podium finisher. But um, I mean, I wasn't like you know first place every meet. Uh, oh, it just, uh, I got you know, that now. All right, you know, I, I mean, on you. <laughs> wait, what's the furthest you threw a shot put, Bert? My senior, sixty-four feet. Oh, that's that was like warm-up stuff. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. My bad. That's my bad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, he out here trying to be modest for you, bro. He's trying to be well, modest. You, see what you, you did. know, it's funny. You brought up the draft thing, and I remember, um, I remember sitting in my house in Philly, and that that Sports Illustrated came. You know, the incredible Balkan had that. Yeah. It was total '80s cheese ball stuff with like yep. a shopping cart full of food. Yeah. And I swear to God, I like went and take a shower, and I caught a picture of myself in the mirror getting out of shower, and I have body dysmorphia since that day. Cause I thought like all first rounders had to look like you. And I, you catch that image, you come out of shower and you're like, what the, and I was like, damn it, I'm never going to make it. <laughs> and I still got body dysmorphia from that cover to this day. I won't take my shirt off. It's it all your head, I won't man. do anything. It's all it might head. be, but still that was, that was, and then I saw you at the combine and that was even worse, man. I even... <laughs> so they were like, like, wait, I, let me give you the combine. This, this is how, and this is how I don't think people realize you're the first offensive lineman to really 
be a star and promote yourself. I mean, I remember there was talk of you fighting Mike Tyson on pay-per-view. Um, didn't you train with Lee Haney, who was Mr. Universe? No, Rory Liedlmeyer. All right. And then, but I remember you pulled up at the combine in like a limo and just got out and took a drug test and, and you walked by me and I was like, shit. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> so part of it was like, I'm not, I was hoping you didn't go to senior ball. Cause I'm like, I'm not going to senior ball. I want to get drafted. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do this, but I was like, was, the whole combine, I mean, we had, we had, you know, the weird thing about our draft was it was so stacked that oh, it was you awesome. almost had to be so, and we didn't know at the time, but you had to be so good. Like, I played five and a half years and had 45 sacks, but because everybody was so great, they still like, oh, you weren't that good. Or you, you, you were overshadowed that. by Barry Sanders, yeah. who could have been the, might be the best ever. Yeah. And then Deion Sanders, Derek Thomas, yeah. I mean, you know, Troy yeah, Aikman. Aikman. So yeah. it was crazy because the combine was all these great players, but it was just you and Dion that everybody talked about. And there was the rest of us were just sideshows pretty much. Yeah. It was. It, it, was, it was it was a sideshow let me, let, let me tell you, it wasn't you guys either <laughs> so when you're going through the combine this question for both of you guys when you're going through the combine and you when do you know i'm getting people's attention did you know that before you even walked in the door or was it doing reps was it doing a 40 yard dash was it doing the interview at what point did both of you guys know okay i got everybody's attention i think for tony though tony was already the the, it was really that whole college football season was just Tony and Deion Sanders. That's all you heard about because they were, they were the best self promoters and the best players. But for me, I don't, I don't, I don't remember the combine being like that big a deal for me. Cause I'd gone to all the all-star games cause I hurt my ankle and missed like six games my senior year. So I had to make up for some. So I kind of made up for it through the all-star games. So the combine was just, you know, another thing for me, but and Tony was already, you know, the, you know, projected the greatest offensive lineman ever. So I don't think it was much for him either. I remember projected, you just going in and projected being the key word. <laughs> yeah. But I remember you coming in, in, in the limo and like some torn off, like Hulk Hogan type, you know, thing with your guns out and tied up at the waist, like a mesh shirt. And I'm like, what the hell? And then got out, did your drug test, got in the limo and left. And that's always, I saw two minutes of you, I think the whole yeah, combat. That- all I did was the, the, the combine was the physical. I did the physical. I did the sit down interview and, yeah. Yeah. and then, you know, met with some GMs and some owners that, you know, were in those teams that were having the top five six to 10 picks, whatever. Um, and, and then what I did, I was in a position where, you know, again, like you said earlier, I was projected to be a top five pick. So when you're project, even I think today, when you're projected to be a top five pick, you have that privilege or that pull to kind of have your own combine at your own college. So I really kind of bought myself like four or six more weeks to prepare from getting beat up from the last football season. So I saw your highlights saying you never got beat up. Come on. I did. I did. You were doing the beating up. Listen, you know, when you do a somersault over somebody after you put them on their back, that shit hurts. Yeah, that's true. You hurt your neck. That's how you hurt your neck. But you know what? You bring up a good point because I think, you know, looking back, you were probably the first person that ever did the private, you know, combine type workout. Because I mean, we even had Dion, you know, was there and Troy was, I mean, everybody was there that was, you know, a top 10 guy at the combine except you. Yeah. <laughs> so they, you were they like, actually the first one to have your own. Yeah, they worked out. And I think, you know, my ego is so out of control. I mean, it was, a lot of it was self-promotion, but uh, I mean, just as much of that self-promotion, I mean, it was, it was ego. I started to believe what was written. Uh, when, when, cause that's a great question. I'm, I'm glad you said that. When did you start to believe it? Cause obviously you, you knew you were playing the, the game of getting select. You were doing the LeVar ball before the LeVar ball. You right, were playing right. the game yeah. of getting the attention, but when right. did you go, damn, I am better. I am this. Yeah. I'd say, well, no, it was probably Tony when you saw me without my shirt in the combine. You're probably well, yeah. like, that's, that's the top D lineman. Okay. I, I got this. I was like, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I got it. I got it. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, listen, Bert did great. I mean, listen, to, how many people in the world can say they've been in the top eight picks in, in the NFL draft? Not many. Well, two of them are here. Yeah. Yeah. One yeah. of them had a good career. <laughs> No, and that's the funny part. My career wasn't even good compared to the guys in our draft. It was just like, you look back at it, it's like, holy smokes. I think to this day, that draft, like the top, say, 10 people taken, I don't think there's been a better, like, 
10, especially the top five, four of them are Hall of Famers. Yeah, and, and you still on those other people like, you know, Andre Risen, Steve Atwater, yeah. there were, you know, Carnell Lake, they were still in that draft, but, you know, Trace Armstrong, they were lower down. Yep. Yep. But yeah, that first round was pretty stacked. It was stacked. It was a great draft. And, uh, but it was, for me, you know, I, I was lucky enough to be able to buy myself some time to prepare more. And, you know, the drug test was at the combine, the actual combine. So, you know, I had gotten off of my stuff, my vitamins, if you will, um, in plenty of time, uh, because I, you know, I guess you could say I was a self-proclaimed chemist. And um, so I knew I would test clean, but you're still nervous, right? Like if you test dirty, it could cost you millions of dollars. It cost me, and, yeah, I tested dirty. Yeah, so I, I tested, you know, I tested clean and um, so- You should just own that clean. shit like me. You should just owned it and, and, and just took a shot the night before, but, listen, pissed in that thing and been like, take it, look at this body. <laughs> It took me what fifteen years to own, ten years to own it. <laughs> what 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 drove you? What what drove you to to put these things in your body? Like what was it the was it the chase to be great? Was it the financial imp implications? Like what what pushed you to take a chance with your health and your life by by putting these things by putting these drugs in your body? You know, part, I mean, part of it was monetary, but that wasn't 51% of it. Um, it was more to be the best, uh, to be the, and it wasn't, you know, I'd like, I would, listen, I would like to say that I was thinking to be the best that I could be, but I wasn't. I was thinking, I want to be the best mf -er that ever played the game. And that was my thought process. And that was my, because I was like, Otherwise, why do you do it? Like, why, why should I do this? If, it's, if not like it's, fun. That. it's not like it's fun at that level. So, right. And it's so it's, you know, and I mean, I was smart enough to know that there's risks involved, um, you know, with heart, with liver, with stuff, with, you know, steroids stuff. There's also, you know, but you know, your head would rationalize it. There's also risks involved with drinking and driving and, and crossing the street. So you rationalize it. But, you know, my motive, literally my motivation, my pure motivation was to be the best player um, on that football field. And when I stepped on the field, I wanted, I don't want to say the word torture, although it would be appropriate. I wanted to break that person's will that I was playing against. I wanted them to give up. I wanted them to do the no mas, you know, and be like, I give, I'm done, you know, or whatever. And on film, you would see it. We, we used to have a category in college when they would grade us. And one was called no mas. And you would just see the player just kind of quit. You could just see when he quit. You could tell. I mean, you know, I'm sure Bert's been at times in plays where he's been tired and then not sprinting to the ball. <laughs> And the film doesn't lie. So the next day when he's watching the film, he's like, you know, I know the coach is going to say, why are you not sprinting to the ball? Even though the ball's 40 yards on the other side of the field and he knows he's not going to catch the guy. Well, you have to sometimes sit back and wait for that cutback. I was playing safety. That's what you were playing yeah. the contain. Casey contained. cut back and came back 26 yards. I was going to get him. <laughs> so, so it was, you know, it was, it was, um, you know, that was the mindset. Um, it wasn't like, it wasn't malicious. But it was, you know, it's hard. To, I guess it's hard to use the word torture and malicious, not at like like meaning opposite things because they do mean opposite things to me. I, I wanted to break the person's will. I wanted them to know that they don't want to play against me. And so, I mean, that ahead. was the era of football that you guys were playing in, though. It wasn't yeah. like it wasn't like now where you you, you even yeah. say these type of words, you get a hundred thousand dollar fine, you get suspended a game. Like <laughs> you guys were out there to sensitivity training, <laughs> right, right, right. You guys were out there hitting people to lay them down so they would not get up. And the game's just yeah. not played that way anymore. It, 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 that's exactly you're exactly correct. But it wasn't to like I mean to injure them. It wasn't like I'm going to go after his knees. Right, it I want to hurt like you. That. I want to hurt you, but you gonna right. walk away. I want to hurt you, but I want to hurt. You. I mean, I don't want to maliciously hurt you. Like as far as like I'm going to take your knees out and end your career. It wasn't like that. It was more like I want to hurt you to break your will to be like you know what i'm not having fun playing this game so we talk about we talk about this a lot and and you were such a high pick and you were so great answer the question you don't have to but bert was asked for money to go to to, to many schools 
didn't get it. Joe Pa walked out the room on him. Did you ever look at a coach and go, hey, man, I need 50 grand to, to come for a visit? Or I need 50 grand, 100 grand. I need a car. I need this to go to a school. Because that was obviously happening at that time. Hell, it's still happening now. Were you ever a part of that? Never got a dime. That's because you threw the shot for 45 feet. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, didn't, uh, didn't Nick Saban recruit you? Yeah. He what was that like? You know, Nick's the same guy. I mean, I, I can't say he's the same guy, but he's fundamentally the same guy he is now that he was then, except, you know, obviously with a lot of wisdom. Um, and trophies. And, and, tro and, yeah, I mean, could arguably be the best college football coach ever to coach. Could arguably. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, he's won more national championships, I think, than any other. That doesn't make you the best one, but it there's it's part of the formula. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of his students graduate. A lot of his players graduate. A lot of his people, like people that play for him really like him. If you're not, if you're not, if you're not going like full speed, you're not going to be on Nick's good side. So and that's how it should be. So when you, you, you come from Canada, you come to Ohio, what made you choose Michigan State? Like, what was the worst school you visited? Because Burke was West Virginia, the worst school. What school did you go to that you go, oh, <laughs> hell no. How, how soon can I leave? Michigan State, probably. <laughs> you're, you're asking me or Burt? No, but we know no, Burt is West Virginia, because that's why I asked this question. Burt was West Virginia. He said that you only see Morgantown from a TV. You don't never, you don't go to it. There was no internet back then, so you couldn't right. know what it was like until you got there. And he He's got the stadium there. Stadium rocking. Right. And you fly in in the middle of the winter, and you land in like somebody's garage on top of a hill where it's snowing, and there's an old like whiskey still outside the airport where you're supposed to get your luggage. And I'm like, man, what am well, I that's doing? Where the, that's where the off-season workouts were for us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what am I doing here? You know, I mean, you know, for me, I mean, it, and it's a great school. So I don't want to bag on the school. So it's, it's West Virginia. It's a great institution. No, it's not yeah. West Virginia. No, it's not West Virginia. It's, it's that school that's 40 miles, 50 miles south of East Lansing, Michigan. Oh, yeah, they're blue and gold? Yeah, the Walmart Wolverine people. Yeah. <laughs> Tony, I got a question for you. I got no disrespect because there's a lot of great. I mean, listen, there's a lot of great. I mean, doctors, lawyers, engineers, great football players. Jim Harbaugh turned me on that. I mean, when I blocked for him in Indy and he was one of the first pe people to welcome me to Indy after my comeback. And, and I was like, wow, that's like I thought internally. I was like, oh, that's interesting. He's a U of M guy and he's a nice guy. You know, he's not. Right. <laughs> hey, let me ask you something, Tony. What? Because, again, I, unless you lived it, I mean, you were such a big name then, and you ended up, I think you called, weren't they, were you the one that called the Green Bay a village, not a yeah. city? Yeah, I did. True indeed. True indeed. Now, Chicago. if you would have ended up in, like, L.A. Raiders, because the Raiders were in L.A. then, right. would you would you just went off the rails like Tom Marinovich because of all the distractions around there? You think it would have hyper-focused you? Because I might have been dead. I might have been dead. Yeah, I might be dead. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to go to a big market. I wanted, to, I wanted. I mean, first choice would have been like the Raiders or, or say one like the Giants or something in New York, somewhere big. Dallas, mm -hmm. even though I wasn't a Dallas fan, still not a Dallas fan. Um, I wanted to go where they had a big market to to maximize, or again, earning potential because a lot of people don't think of a football player as hey, they also have a you know they think business too. This is a very short lived career. And um, so I was thinking, you know, I'll get the most benefit from a bigger market. Um, so I called Green Bay a village. And then after yeah, I signed right. with them, I kind of, I, you know, I'm like, how do you, you know, how do you backpedal on that one? So I, at a press conference, I told them, look, I did call you guys a village, but every village <laughs> needs a village idiot. Right. So <laughs> good, nice. Good rebound. Wait, was, so, so when did yeah. you know they were going to take you? In the draft? Yeah. Well, I think two weeks prior, uh, the Cowboys made an announcement that said that they were going to take Troy on draft day. Like they, they said that two weeks prior. So it was really anticlimactic because then Green Bay came out and said, if Dallas does take Troy, we're going to take, you know, me. Um, so it, it, it was anticlimactic, but it was, it was, uh, you know, it wasn't like a surprise, you know, Brett Favre was your quarterback, right? 
only my last year. Uh, Don Mikowski was my first three years there. Okay. Magic. The magic man. Yeah. So you get to, you get to Green Bay. And what's your life like in Green Bay? Because obviously your life at Michigan, you were focused on getting to that level where you were at in Green Bay. So once you get, you achieved the goal, what was your life like? What was driving you then? Nothing. Hmm. Um, draft day, like, you know, I was you know, 21, 22 years old. I was in the stands of Lambeau with my brother because that's where they held the draft, like Green Bay held their like central headquarters there at the stadium. And you know, at 11, I made a decision to play in the NFL at 21, 22, which is 10 years, 10, 11 years. That's not a long time. You're drafted the second player in the draft. And I sat in the stands, you know, in this empty stadium and they were doing some construction because some bleachers were tore up and they were improving the stadium. And, you know, and, and I talked to my brother and I was like, we were like, you yeah, know, we kind of, we did it, you know? And, and it, but I was like, this is not like, it's a let, I was almost kind of like a letdown and it had mm -hmm. nothing to do with the Packers. It had to do with my expectations of what it was going to be like. What'd you expect? You know, I, not what, I, not what it was. It, it was, it was kind of, um, you think that's because it was green Bay and not no, LA I, or no, I don't, I don't think it was. I don't think it was because it was green Bay. I think it was what I, th what I found out in my life. I'm, you know, 54 now. So I've had some life experience and this is in almost everything I do. I enjoy the process much more than the end game. Ah. And I've, you know, I've found that out about myself in photography and whatever the case may be. I way more enjoy the process and the work and the grind to get there. And then when I get there, I do acknowledge it and I do appreciate it. But within 24 hours, I'm like, next like what's next? What what's next on the list to tackle? And I think that's what happened at that time. I had no idea that that's what was happening. But and and then I was, you know, I think you know, there's no doubt that the steroids were part of the thing, but they were really a for me a good distraction to, to the media and other people because I was at that point already starting to get hooked on painkillers. Mm. And both injectable. In college? In college? Um, no, uh, after I left college. Injectable playing painkillers, you were hoping? Injectable for? and orals, yeah. And I would mainline the injectable, like, you know, from phar pharmaceutical stuff. And um, so, you know, it was like, I always considered a drug addict um, someone that puts a needle in their arm, right? Like, I mean, in your, in your vein, right? And how often did you do that with the pain injections? There was with the injections, I, I did that every day for three years. Oh, in the NFL at Green Bay. So who was there no oversight? Was there someone giving you this? Was there someone not basically looking the other way while you were doing this? Like, what was the infrastructure like for you to either get your hands on something of this nature or for you to carry this out? So, you know, there was some people, there was definitely people that knew something was wrong um you'd have to be pretty naive not to know something like so, like this guy's something's wrong with this guy there's something and it's and it's not steroids or lack of steroids it's like this doesn't do it to you. your eyes don't sink into your eye sockets you know and are dark because of you know you stopped using steroids eight months ago i stopped using steroids many times and you lose about 10 or 15 percent so if I was mentioned 600 and I lose 10 or 15%, you're still pretty strong. You're still strong enough to play in the NFL. So, but the, the good thing, or what I thought was a good thing for me was everybody was so focused, the media, everybody was so focused on, well, he's not doing well because now he's not taking steroids. Uh. When the actual fact was what I was doing, I was conning about 10 doctors in about four different states mm. to get prescriptions that would, are supposed to last me a month that would last me about four or five days. And, you know, and that cycle repeated itself all through, you know, those four years in Green Bay and then three years after that being out of the league. I think, yeah. And, and I think the most impressive thing with you is that people don't realize is you were out of the league for three years, then went back to Indy, became a starter 
and then you needed surgery again. And I guess that's how that's how bad the pull was for the painkillers that you just retired. So you wouldn't have to go through that again. Is that was that part of it? The pain pills you are like, I can't go through another surgery and start this over again. Yeah. And, you know, and, and by that time, but it's, you know, I signed with Green Bay. I was 11 months sober. And when I left treatment, I had no intention of going back to the NFL. I just wanted to freaking be normal. I mean, I was like, it was, it was hell. It was literally the closest thing I could describe to what hell would be like a living hell. Um, Is that because of the, the, the pain drugs or because you lived in Green Bay? Yeah, no, I don't think no, no. Green Bay. Yeah, Green, that's no, hell right no, there. No, too. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's, I see Wait, hell. How are you guys going to spin this? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 this is a spin free zone. Well, like I said, I'm from yeah. Chicago. I hate Green right. Bay, period. Right, right. When you showed up, when you no, go, it had, nothing, I'm, it, it, it had nothing to do with the pack. It was, it was me. It was, I was, the problem was me. And, um, and then, you know, going back to play and then I was 11 months sober. And like I said, when I left treatment, I was like 255. My, I had like jaundice. My skin was at a slight shade of yellow. So I you look like me at the combine, pretty much. No, yeah, yeah, well, right. so, I got it. Somewhere in between, right? Thanks. <laughs> so we should. That. So the this was the big. The difference was I had a mullet, and you yeah, I remember right? that. <laughs> so this question for you too, Bert. When when you were in the locker room, when you guys were in these locker rooms, did you see other people partaking in this stuff, or was it just one of those things where? Because I know steroids, Bert. You spoke out a lot about steroids, Tony. You obviously were going through something with 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 the painkillers did you guys see other people in the locker room doing similar things well with me i i think and you have to you have to remember this 30 years ago so steroids were much more prevalent high school college especially in college there was way more in college than i saw in the pros because they started testing then um i don't think what people realize is if you're if you're injecting steroids or you're or you're taking the pills for you know however long in college it it becomes a gateway to do other stuff because it becomes easy so it's not like you know i can say oh well, i'm the I'm already taking steroid injections. Why can't I take painkiller injections to, you know, take this edge off or something else? So for me, I think it becomes more of a gateway than anything else. Tony might think different, but. No, I agree. I mean, it's a, your inhibition goes down a little bit, you know, and, and it's like, Hey, if, you know, it's like, if I can, you know, keep it really fundamental, if I could take a dollar out of the till, it's a lot easier to take $5 the next time, you know, yeah. or, you know what I'm saying? It'll, it'll yeah. keep getting worse, Right. Yeah. And, and then before you know it, you're like robbing banks and, and you're doing stuff and you're in prison and you're going, how did I get here? So that's how I wake up one day. And I'm like, how did I get to this point where I'm taking 90 painkillers a day? Yeah. Cause that's my well, next, that's, that was my next question. When did you, when did you go? Oh, damn, I think I'm in trouble. Like to yourself, because obviously people can see and people have their opinions, but the individual knows when, like they say, when you've hit rock bottom. Right. At what at what point did you go? Oh, oh, I think I'm in trouble. Well, th there was, I mean, there was a couple times. One time was against Reggie White. <laughs> <laughs> but, we all in trouble then, though. Don't worry about. It. <laughs> That's nothing to be ashamed. I think you knew you were in trouble when they said with the second pick that Green Bay Packers select, and you're like, I got to move to Green Bay. That's probably when you got in trouble. You know, I, I know you won't say anything bad about Green Bay. <laughs> well, I love Green Bay. I really do. I mean, they're them and India. The two teams are my favorite teams. And, I mean, the uh, town, though. I mean, there's a reason. The town, you know, the, the town was me, though. I mean, the town was like like what I grew up in rural, like rural Canada, just outside of Toronto. Like you'd be in downtown Toronto, four million people go 20 miles. You're out in the country. Yeah. So it was like that in Green Bay. And I liked the snowmobile. I did my whole life. Well, it's a great state to snowmobile. It's a great state to hunt. It's a great state. You know, I didn't ice fish, but there was an ice fisher. There was all that stuff. Did I want to be there in the winter? Heck no. How about say you live in Phoenix? There's no snowmobile and there's no hunting and there's no fishing. There isn't Flagstaff up by <laughs> Northern, right. Michigan, or Northern Arizona University. But what I do is I go up to Flagstaff at least once a winter to remind myself why I live here. That's smart. To, yeah. To realize that, you know, it's like I do miss the snow at Christmas and I do miss the seasons. Um, Flagstaff is a lot like the Midwest, but they're at like nine, ten thousand feet elevation. So. so this question pertains more to what to what happened today. I, I don't know if you're aware of Tiger Woods being in an accident um, and being rushed to emergency surgery, uh, having his legs worked on. Apparently he's got leg injuries. And Tiger Woods has a history of uh, substance abuse. 
And when you see an athlete of that magnitude, because you were up there with him at one point in time, again, you were, you were, I was never, uh, maybe not uh, success wise, <laughs> maybe not success wise, but name recognition. Right. right. At one point in time in your life, yeah. name recognition, you were a very popular, well known person. And there is no person who will tell you no. Like when Bert was stealing kids' checks from housing, no one was going to tell him no. I wasn't you get, stealing them. You were taking them. Call it what you no, want. No, we had an agreement. We had an agreement. Cool. Better than me and them. discussion. It was a discussion. Yeah, we had a discussion. It You're was a, a one-way man. discussion. <laughs> Give me your housing check. I'm gonna beat your ass. <laughs> That's all. And you, I'm gonna take your lunch money. Yeah. <laughs> you see me in the shower. <laughs> you you in these. No one I'm will tell me no. Body fat. Or I have an unlimited resources to get what I want to to feel the way I want to feel. How do you go about getting out of that? Well, I mean, it was uh, like, this is how like easy it got. I mean, it literally got as easy as like, I could walk up to a pharmacist and with four tickets to a Packer game mm. and be like, I need a refill of these, you know, an empty bottle. And it was a, like a legit prescription, but it was zero refills. Right. I said, and I said, I need a refill of these. And, and I knew that the pharmacist would probably say, well, you know, we got to call your doctor or there's zero refills. And I'd be like, um, no, we can't call the doctor. And I would just put an envelope down with like four tickets. And the guy would just be like, yeah, if you want to wait 15 minutes. So the first time I ever did that, I was scared to death because I was like, God, is he calling the cops? How good were you know, the seats? How good right? were the seats? <laughs> wait, you know, you know what's the worst part? That's the difference between being in Green Bay, an iconic place. I, when I was with the Chargers, if I put four game tickets down, they wouldn't let me refill my big gulp. <laughs> they'd, arrest, they'd arrest you for coming in there with that idea. No, they'd be like, what do you want, a, a big gulp? I'm not even giving you a <laughs> refill in your big gulp for these tickets. Man. Yeah, Green Bay, I mean, they, they, I mean it was, tickets crazy. were hard to get. Yeah. Still hard to get. And so when it, you was, were... it, was like, it was like that stupid easy, you know? It was like, that shouldn't be that. I mean, it shouldn't be that way. And here, you know, it's like, here is me saying that, right? Right. But so... it's... It, when, when you make the comeback and you're in Indianapolis and you you realize, oh, I have another injury and you start having reflections on whether you want to continue to do this, what would you say were some of the highlights of the things that you remember on a positive note about your playing career that you look back on today and you go, other than getting my ass kicked by Reggie White, this other thing was really cool? Well, in the, in the Indianapolis years, um, you know, like everything was good everything was good i mean and, and and i was actually kind of felt fortunate to play against reggie because he played then for the pack and mm -hmm. and they won a super bowl i think while i was in indy but the thing was you know reggie was still awesome but he wasn't the reggie he was five years prior but he uh. was still way above average i mean he was like hitting a concrete pillar instead of you know drywall so <laughs> so I'm driving. So, so I played pretty decent. I mean, I played pretty decent and held my own against Reg. I didn't kick his butt, but he didn't kick mine either. Um, and I was a lot stronger. I had a clear head. So I was strong as heck and clean, no drugs, no nothing, a little bit of creatine, you know, <laughs> but uh, it was, it was, uh, you know, I slayed a lot of internal demons um, that I had to deal with to prove to myself that I could play this game without like, you know, substance, you know, other substances in my body um you know like for painkillers if i really needed it i would take an anti-inflammatory from the doctor which was you know a non-mind-altering thing it would just take the inflammation down in your joints and stuff i would take uh, you know high doses of ibuprofen which is more or less advil um which is not great for your liver right and there i kind of found myself laughing at myself in india i'm worried about my liver with ibuprofen yet i was injecting all these steroids <laughs> <laughs> so it, you know when it came down to the shoulder i had cracked the back i had cracked the bone in my back against miami and and then i was done for the season because it was like five games left this was my last and i never knew that that would be my last play of my career because it was in Miami. And then, so they said, we're just going to put you on IR because we, you don't need surgery for your back, but you need it to be in this brace and just, it'll grow back like the facet. It was a broken facet. And, and I said, well, since my shoulder is also so bad and I'm going to be out, 
why don't we go in there, scope it, clean it up, or see what's wrong with it and do whatever. So they went in there and they were like, you know, like when you go under anesthesia and you come out and you're like, when are we going to start? Because, you know, your time thing is so screwed up. So I, so that's what happened, right? And I said, so when are we going to start? I said, it, it, he goes, well, we were only in there five minutes and then we just stopped the surgery. And, and so it really legitimately only was five minutes. And they said, really, there's nothing there to fix. Your shoulder is like worn out. It's like, mm. like the bone, like there was the bone and then your shoulder bone that went over it. Well, the, this shoulder bone was like here because all of this had deteriorated from all the hitting, the practicing, the power pulls, the lifting, the deadlifts, all that stuff. And, you know, the doc said, and they all knew, they all knew my situation with the the narcotics and stuff the problem i had with narcotics and i and I didn't drink and do all that stuff they knew that before i even signed with them i wanted them to know i wanted it to hear them from the horse's mouth that what you're getting is damaged goods just so you know so you don't hear it from somebody so i'm not trying to con you and sign and then you find out or i tell you later i want you to know up front you're getting damaged goods um, because legitimately, look, that's what it was. And I was fortunate even to get an opportunity to get a workout with Indy because I was pretty thorough in burning my bridges. I burned them all when mm -hmm. I left. So Indy gave me a chance and I, and I knew all I needed was a chance. So they knew. And, and then the doctor said, now he goes, I know your situation with the painkillers. He goes, you're, you know, you're 28, you're a lineman. He's like, you know, you're not young, but you're not super old. You can still play some years, but with the injury, he's like, you could probably squeak out one more year. He goes, but we would probably have to manage it with pain, like pain meds. And he said, you know, we'll hold on to the meds. He did his due diligence, like very professionally, which is rare because most doctors are not like this. And he was like, well, we'll hold on to the painkillers. We will give you a painkiller when you need it or whatever the case may be. And, you know, the only thought in my head was I am not going back to hell. Mm. I don't care how much money the next year was. And it was a seven figures. And, you know, and I gracefully said, you know what? I've said, you know, I, I pretty much did what I wanted to do. I tried to make a lot of things that I wronged right. And I felt I did that. Now, there was a lot of things I did that were wrong that were, you just can't make right. So, I mean, that's out of my control. I just, there's things that are just, you just can't make right. Things you did or said or, or whatever the case may be. But there was a lot of things that could be corrected by keeping your mouth shut, working your ass off every day, giving that organization everything you got and earning your money, right? Instead of what I would say I didn't quite really earn my money in, in Green Bay for what they paid. Um, and I felt that I did that. And then that injury came up and I was like, I slayed my demons. I feel good. And uh, I was like, it's not worth it. The, the, it was like a 1.3, I think 1.1 or 1.3 million the next year to make. And I was like, it, it's not worth 10 million. It's not worth 20 million. You've had this crazy, you have this crazy up and down. You've had this, this amazing life. I think crazy is, is a good word to describe it, but at the same time, you've had so many experiences. You've done so many things in your life. Where are you now? What's going on with you now? So I've been in Phoenix last, um, since 2005. So last 15, 16 years and Phoenix Scottsdale area. And um, I really kind of, you know, kind of like, kind of like jumped off the cliff and I figured I'll grow my wings on the way down with photography. And mm. I, 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 it was a passion. I wanted to do it and some, you know, figure out how to monetize it to make a living doing it. And, and it was, yeah, I knew it would take time and it did and it has, and it, and it is, it came to fruition and it's, it was, it was doing well on, you know, until COVID hit because like that was like a business where you're you know interacting right. with people so it, it you know it, it kind of disrupted it but in a lot of ways the covid year was a great year for me not as not necessarily monetarily but there was a lot of major back burner projects that i had that i never could get to because i was busy with photography and part of that was part of the back burner projects was 
my podcast. He Part does. of the back burner project was um, uh, making my my book up on audio, making it an audio book that I released in 2009. And I'm going to add. What's the chapters. name of the book? What's the name of the book? It's called My Dirty Little Secrets. Um, to, you know, Tony Manager's story. I think it's uh, Steroids, Alcohol, and God is the like subtitle. Is there any particular order? Um, in that order. Sweet. Steroids first. Yeah. Is that so? Is that picture that's the you took that picture behind you? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's one of the most wicked places I've ever seen in Michigan. It was uh, up in northern Michigan in in a bay, and those trees looked like someone took a bunch of trees, uprooted them, turned them upside down, and stuck them in the ground. I'd never seen anything like it because the top of the trees were the roots. Wow. I'd never seen anything like it. Tony, if I told you. Uh... You remember, you remember back in the day, um, I get drunk in my IROC car phone and call you at Michigan State? No, I don't remember. See that? You were on them painkillers. That's why. You were on them narcotics. Right. <laughs> well, I used well, to, if I would, all right. And one, I was always drunk. You weren't drunk. IROC. I was on my IROC. I had a car phone right in the, man, I don't even talk about it. Acid wash jeans on. I was killing it. So if I would have told you you were going to be a photographer 30 years from now, what would you have said to me? Because I would have, you would back then you would have been like big game hunter or something, bear wrestler. Right. I would have been like photographer. I would have been like your 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 high. Is what <laughs> I would I'd be said. like, no, I'm drunk. I'm not high. I'm drunk. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I I wouldn't have believed. I wouldn't have believed. I can't I mean, believe you don't remember me calling you. You know how much a, a car phone call out of state costs in 1988? I don't. Man. That was with the brick, right? The brick, the Motorola brick phone? No, 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 no. No. See, I think it was before story, that. Yeah. It was before that. Remember that was one it? you had to carry with a suitcase and it came off oh, the top? Yeah, yeah. I had one of them. Like James Bond. Yeah, but it yeah. wasn't James <laughs> Bond. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, Tony, thank you for your time, man. This has been unbelievable. Thanks. It's been great to talk to you. I'm pretty sure. Bert's acid wash jeans had nothing to do. It had nothing on what you had rocking on back in the day. Well, I know Bert won't even stand up because he's wearing those acid yeah. wash jeans. <laughs> you only, but Tony, you could tell you only had two looks as a football player in the 80s, pretty much. It was acid wash jeans or your cut off football pants for pretty shorts. Much. Pretty much. And that was it. Yeah, you just wore that. Yeah. Yeah. And I've maintained that now for the last 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> I still got a swatch watch. Don't it is hate. so hard to find those jeans now. That's the problem. <laughs> You no, got to you get them. You got to you got to buy them whenever you see them. <laughs> yeah, I'll send you a pair. <laughs> <laughs> you want Bugle Boy or you want the Guess? I got both. Oh, I'll take God. both. I'll take All right. both. All right, yeah. I'll send them out to you. Yeah, chicks dig that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> thanks, Tony. Guys, thanks. It was a privilege to be on here. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Tony. Good All luck. Right. Be good. All right. Bye.